just what you wanted on your Friday night. Two bald guys talking policy. Oh, it doesn't get much better. I'm John Caldera, president of the Independence Institute and your devil's advocate. A good friend of ours, Radley Balko's here. Radley, good to see you again. Uh, it's great right. to be back in Colorado. All right, I, I'm trying to, de how, how best to describe what you do. <laughs> You're uh, more of a civil libertarian writer. You work for um, Reason and Cato and Good Institutes, and then then for the sake of some quick coin, you're now you're working for, for a Huffington <laughs> Post, and and so you're a sellout yeah. uh, civil libertarian. But you've you've done well. Yeah. Well, the uh, <laughs> uh, the work I do for Huffington Post, I think I don't think any libertarians could object to. Uh, I mean, it's mostly investigative journalism, looking at uh, you know. Bad cops, bad whatever, prosecutors. Whatever uh, makes you sleep at sure, night, my sure, friend. Yeah. Sure, sure. Hey, I want to talk to you about, about this. This, okay. this is fascinating. Rise of the warrior cop and how, how the role of police in America has changed over the years. And, and I, I, find it, I find it fascinating. So let's, let's, let's go back. First of all, why would you want to write it? Well, uh, this is an issue I've been writing about for probably seven or eight years. Um, it goes back to when I was at Cato. I actually wrote a white paper on the same issue for Cato called Overkill. And uh, it's, it's something I've just sort of stuck with. I mean, there are cases I've actually been writing about for five or six years now as they sort of work their way through the court systems. Um, and, you know, it, it just keeps happening. I mean, you keep reading these stories about uh, police raiding the wrong house, uh, about SWAT mission creep where, you know, we're now doing SWAT raids for neighborhood poker games or for underage drinking. I mean, both of those things have happened. Uh, and so, I mean, I've sort of watched as this trend has kind of grown even in the seven or eight years that I've been covering it. and. Uh, it was really uh, the Occupy movement, oddly enough, and the, the crackdowns on the Occupy protesters uh, that got, uh, I think, publishers and sort of a national discussion going on this issue again, and, and that's kind of what led to the book. All right, let's, let's start off with, let's start off with the way beginning. Let's bring it back to the founding of the nation. Okay. We didn't have police. And, and help, help me understand this, because this, I, I have such an amazing respect for, for how law enforcement is done in this country, that it, it comes from uh, rule of law, not rule mm -hmm. of a dictator or rule of a political party, that our law enforcement has a check and balance that comes through the system and they have genuine authority. And that authority is, is, is a, there's a check and balance to it. And that's, yeah. that's a beautiful thing. It wasn't always that way. Talk about before the revolution. What, you know, bad people have been doing bad things forever, yeah. and and people have always screamed to the government, "Stop that guy!" What was it like? So, you know, and when we, when we were in the the colonies, the colonial stage of of uh, this country before the revolution, um, policing was was done by it was sort of a, a community enforcement. Uh, you had, you know, villages and communities that where everybody, you know, worshipped at the same church, who sort of came from the same country, had the same values. And so sh shunning and social pressure uh, were a great way of sort of keeping order and enforcing the law because, you know, being shunned by your community uh, at a time when, you know, you couldn't go online and meet another friend. <laughs> exactly, yeah. and it could, you know, I mean, you'd, you, there weren't many other places you could go. I mean, the frontier was still dangerous. Uh, you needed the people around you to sort of support you. So it was much easier to keep order uh, in those days. And and yeah, I mean, there wasn't any, there weren't any policing. And you know, most of the country at that time came from England, which had this kind of tradition of of uh, common law that was more deferential to civil liberties than uh, you know the 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 court or the criminal codes that you saw in continental Europe, uh, and that carried over here too. That that kind of uh, tradition of respecting civil liberties. The British came, all yeah. right. The I'm always amazed. Uh, it's the Third Amendment. You right. will not quarter troops. Yeah. And I look at the Bill of Rights, and we 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 have been so good on some of these rights. Then you look at the Bill the, the Third, and nobody goes. What? Huh? What? 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 Yeah. I don't even. The idea of the government forcing you to feed and house uh, an, a standing army um, uh, in your own home is something that's so uh, so antithetical to anything we could imagine. Well, and I, you know, in the book, I, I bring up the Third Amendment because I think it's interesting and kind of provocative. But you know, it's more. The Third Amendment is really a more than about more than just quartering troops in your home. If you look at the. Um, the history behind it and read some of the scholars that have written about sort of the debate that was going on at the time. Uh, the Third Amendment was, I mean, it was very specifically about courting troops and homes, but there was also kind of a, um, a broader kind of symbolism and sentiment behind it, which was this uh, aversion to militarism. Um, the founders were very familiar with uh, the Republic of Rome. They were all big fans of the Republic of Rome, and they saw how uh, when the Praetorian Guard sort of took over in Rome during the Empire stage, uh, the whole society sort of 
became infused with militarism. So, you know, generals and, and uh, you know, battle heroes became more prominent in Roman society than, say, you know, poets or uh, scholars. Uh, and they saw that that was sort of a, one of the kind of warning signs that the Republic was falling. And they, the, they, they, they were aware of the European history where there were similar examples after the fall of the Roman Empire. Uh, and so there, was, there, there has always been kind of this uh, uh, aversion to the idea of, of, um, of, a, of a culture that becomes infused with militarism. And this, this goes to standing armies, uh, which of course the, the founders were terrified of, this idea of having an internal why, why standing were, army. Why were they terrified of that? Well, they, they, the, they had firsthand experience with this in Boston, right? In the uh, decades leading up to the American Revolution, the, uh, Britain had assigned soldiers to the streets of Boston solely for the purpose of enforcing day-to-day -day laws, the import laws and the tax laws. And they had these broad warrants, uh, general warrants called writs of assistance, which, you know, there was no time limit on them. They, if, if you had one, it, it lasted until the, a year after the death of the king who was in power when it was issued. Uh, and you could basically, you could raid any home you want. You could kick down doors, you could look for contraband, and you could seize anything that you found. Um, and they were called writs of assistance because it also gave you the power to compel anyone else to help you enforce the warrant. And so this, as you might imagine, I mean, people, this did not go over well, right? Uh, I mean, you had soldiers kicking down doors. They, in some ways, they were kind of better than warrants today because you weren't allowed to serve them at night, so you couldn't, you know, break really? into people's homes at night. Um, <laughs> and you had to knock and announce first, so there were no no-knock raids. But, you know, if nobody came to the door, then you could break, break in. Uh, but of course, as you might imagine, I mean, this led to a lot of confrontation and anger uh, among the colonists. People like John Henry sort of rose up against it. James uh, Otis Jr., who's one of my sort of heroes of the kind of founding era. The guy who did sitting on a dock of a bay? No, <laughs> that's, uh, that's Otis Redding. Oh, sorry. Uh, but, uh, the guy from Mayberry. Al also a hero. Also of mine. a hero of yours. Yeah. Oh, well, and Drunk Otis yeah. is also yeah. a hero of mine, obviously. Uh, so, so cops back then, were, were they considered police, yeah. these people, or were they considered, were they considered military. In other words, if these were British soldiers or if they worked for the British Crown, usually from some other country, were they, were, were they, these are the police and if, if a crime was committed, somebody stole somebody or something, uh, if uh, assault happened, did they run to the nearest troop? Or? No, the, so the, the soldiers were there to enforce British law uh, against the colonists. So they're, in, they're there to enforce the laws that the colonists didn't want to follow, that the, Brit that the UK wanted, them, basically revenue stuff. Um, the if there were the day-to-day -day crimes, uh, those were still handled mostly privately. I mean, you had a sheriff or, or maybe a, a constable of some kind. Uh, What's a constable? I've heard the term. It, it's, it's a, a nice a, British term. Oh, yeah, constable. But what, it, what does that mean? It, it's kind of a. It's basically a sheriff. It's it's kind of the British version of a sheriff. Um, but they, you know, in the British colonies, they they also had sort of court king appointed constables. Uh, but then you had locally elected elected sheriffs. You had uh, some maybe called themselves marshals. But their duties were largely administrative. They were they they. So they, you know, served subpoenas to people. They uh, collected uh, fees and taxes. Um, we didn't really have police like we have today. There were no incarceration as a punishment was almost non-existent. You know, you had the stocks maybe, or you had the death penalty. Uh, there's very little in between. Uh, and so there weren't really police as, as we know them today. So, you know, the, when, the, when the British stationed the soldiers in the streets of Boston and people were sort of having this daily uh, these daily run-ins with authority figures. Um, and, you know, Boston was kind of a hub of individualism and revolutionary fervor. And so, you know, this was, this was one of the worst cities for the, for the, Brit for the British to have tried this. Uh, and, of course, this all culminated then eventually with the Boston Massacre, which you know, I think a lot of historians would argue were the first shots of the American Revolution. All right. The Revolution comes. Mm. The standing army goes. Uh, the troops are gone. There's still a need for law and order. What happens in the early states? How how do we get from no police mm -hmm. to police? So a, a couple of things. So we do end up getting as a, sort of a standing army. I mean, we get the the the, um, the Constitution does allow Congress to raise funds for an army. It you know, has to be reappropriated every two right. years, but. Uh, we get the second and third and the tenth amendments, which I think were sort of a compromise between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, and this idea that, all right, we'll have a, an, an army for national defense, but you know we want all these precautions in place to prevent that army from being turned against the people to sort of which protect is, well, whoever's we in power. Arm the people; uh, they can right. keep and bear arms. You can't put those troops that we're going to use elsewhere inside people's homes. Before, and you have the Fourth yeah. Amendment that we're not right. going to let what happened in Boston happen yeah, here. Yeah, you, you can't um, you can't knock down a door and just start looking around and uh, allegedly, and allegedly, <laughs> allegedly. And, um, yeah, because you wouldn't want the NSA to do that kind of stuff. Sure. And, and then we said states have the rights outside. So these, these were protections from the federal armies yep. 
controlling us. Exactly. So what happens then is is you continue you get you we continue with sort of this idea of, of uh, private prosecutions of crimes. You have you know grand juries. You have posse you know posses that get called up when there's an escaped fugitive or somebody dangerous. Um, and so the approach to law enforcement is still kind of a, a private sort of thing. There you know there are. Um, when you say private, do you mean private or do you mean community? I mean, is it is it that somebody puts out the money and it's a, you know, well, it's, I've been robbed, I'm going to put out a reward, uh, everybody go out and get this guy and I'll pay you? Well, so, so not, yeah, so not only did we not have permanent police at this time, we also didn't have pro permanent prosecutors. I mean, you know, there's an attorney, an attorney right. general maybe or even a state attorney general, but beyond that, there wasn't like a district attorney at the time. So if you wanted to bring criminal charges against somebody, it was up to you to sort of make your case before a grand jury and ask them to indict this person. And if, you know, once that happened, then, uh, you know, you could maybe summon a posse to arrest that person and then you have your trial. But you were basically responsible for making the case against this other person. Um, and this was a, a way of kind of balancing things out, right? I mean, the government did have the power to punish this person, but, um, you know, it was a citizen making the complaint and a citizen defending himself from the complaint. Um, and when we move into an era where we have full-time police departments, full-time prosecutors, uh, I think, you know, some of the more, your more libertarian historians had argued that that balance shifts. When did that happen? When, uh, so when, do, when do we get police? Because Americans, we love our police. Yeah. You know, we, you know, throughout the rest of the nation or the rest of the world, if, if you need help, the last person you're going to call is a cop. That, I can't. I can't imagine. That's true in, in Latin America. It's true in the, the developing world. But in you know a lot of Western uh, Europe, with the exception maybe of Spain and uh, in Eastern Europe. I was gonna, I was going to say if you're if you're in Colombia, yeah, and you know the last last place you're going to go is is to a cop, mm. you know because they don't work for you. They don't work for the law. They they work for the regime or they work for themselves. Right. So when when did this start? When did when did police departments? When did formal police systems and prosecutors happen? Yeah, so this, this starts to happen in the, um, the, the sort of mid-19th uh, century, uh, the 1820s, 30s, 40s. And what happens is, is America starts urbanizing. We start getting lots of immigrants coming in, living in close quarters together. Uh, now you have people who don't necessarily worship at the same place, who, who don't come from the same country, have the same values. So shunning and sort of community pressure on people to, to conform uh, isn't as effective when, you know, you don't really care right. what your neighbor thinks of you. <laughs> right. um, so shun me all you like. Right. right. So so um, so we get this. We get the need for uh, organized police uh, systems because you know you also get people coming from countries you know that don't necessarily like one another who are now living in close quarters. You get rioting and you get fights, uh, and so we get this idea of, of you know these these police systems start to evolve, and and the, it's mostly in the big cities in the northeast. Like where? Uh, well, the first were, first departments in America were in Boston and New York, Philadelphia. Were they called behind. police? Uh, or they were, were they called constables back then? Uh, they were called police, or uh, if if you they were closely adopting the British model, they would be called coppers. Uh, um, the um, uh, Sir Anton Peel was the, the British sort of father of modern policing, and our early police departments were sort of modeled after what he had set up in London. Um, but, you know, it, so, so you get the departments in the Northeast. In the South, interestingly enough, uh, multi, the Southern kind of police tradition evolved out of slave patrols. Uh, so in the South, you actually had, you know, you didn't have the kind of ethnic diversity that you had the, in the North. Uh, the crime was very low in the South. The biggest threat to people in power in the South were slave revolts. And so you got these organized, uniformed uh, police agencies that sort of started to spring up uh, for the purpose of preventing slave revolts. And what I find fascinating about it is they were not, I mean, they were permitted to go in and, um, you know, enter any slave quarters they wanted. They could also uh, arrest you as a slave owner if you violated laws like there were laws in some states against educating slaves. Uh, so the slave patrols actually had the power to arrest slave owners uh, as well. And there are and lots these, of... And these were not private organizations. These, these, uh, these police had the force of the law. They did. They right. had so the force. This, this wasn't like a bunch of plantation owners hiring a private security company. This was, they passed the law, and this, th these cops are there to make sure your slaves don't, exactly. don't misbehave. And, in, and there, are, there are several places in the South, no, probably the most, the largest city is probably Charleston, South Carolina, whose modern police department, I mean, there's a continuous line. It goes back, it was started as a slave patrol uh, and sort of evolved into what, you know, the, the police department that we see now. Go back to my childhood. I, <laughs> I, I grew up watching Andy Griffith. All right, so this is this is the image that we have of police. In fact, you know, we love law enforcement. Um, when when there's problems, we call them, and mm -hmm. we we pick up the phone. We expect them to be there. 
and we we still have I still have this image of, of Andy Griffith you know Sandy uh, what was it? Andy Taylor that was his name yeah and he was part of the community he would you know he was the guy you'd see at church and you'd see him at the fu social function and when when your cousin was you know having a making the still against the law mm -hmm. he would come in and take care of it so I can see how all what you say brings us up to that point and how can you, there's nothing wrong with Andy Taylor, isn't it? That's, that's good policing. Yeah, I, th I think there's a danger here of sort of pining for something that never really existed. Um, I mean, it was a, you know, this was a TV show. Um, I, you know, I love, there, there's a great, actually, uh, Andy uh, Griffith's uh, show, uh, scene, our Mayberry scene, where uh, Opie uh, surreptitiously records a conversation between somebody in the jail and his attorney and where he admits to the crime. And Opie plays it, or tries to play it for his dad, like he's so excited that he caught him admitting the crime. And, uh, his dad says, no, 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 I can't hear that. You don't understand. It's sort of like, you know, educating the country on attorney pri pri uh, client privilege and the Fourth Amendment. And I mean, it was fascinating to sort of watch. But also what, what makes our system different than the system we grew out of. Right. Yeah. Uh, but the, but uh, you know, that era uh, was not without its problems. Uh, you know, this was the page, what we might, the, the early days of policing up until about the 1940s, 50s. Uh, or what you might call the patronage era, uh, and this is where basically local political machines controlled the police department. So, how so? Uh, well, pl police the, the job of police officer during the patron patronage era was an appointed position. It wasn't a career. It was basically sort of a political office that you held. Um, and so the re police weren't trained. There was no sort of set set of standards that they were to follow. Uh, and so what you would have is you would have laws sort of selectively enforced. So in some ethnic neighborhoods in a city, you know, the alcohol laws might be vigorously enforced. In others, they may not be f enforced at all. Um, you know, there was beatings were frequent. Uh, if you happen to be, say, an Italian caught in an Irish neighborhood where the police would all be Irish. Uh, and so, and you also had a problems with stability. So if a new political machine sort of took over in the city, all the police officers would be fired and you would sort of repopulate uh, the force with more political appointments. So there were, you know, I, well, I, instead of the word patronage, would would crony be a, a better term? Oh, sure. Or, I mean, that, that, would, that, would the, that work? It was all the problems all that right. come with any sort of appointed political position. I mean, it was corruption. There were shakedowns. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I do think there is a... Um, uh, uh, you know, I, I argue in the book that things have gotten pretty bad now, but I also, I, th I think there's a danger of sort of pining for, you know, an idealized time in American history where, you know, policing was like it is in Mayberry. Uh, and I don't think, you know, on a broad scale that ever existed. All right, let, let, let's bring it more towards today. Sure. When you use the term militarization of police, what, what do you mean? Now that we've got a sense of what the military was like before the country was founded, mm -hmm. uh, the patronage jobs, and then, you know, for me, there's the still the strong bond we have with law enforcement because we like the law. The law treats us all equally. What's militarization? So if you go back to, again, revisit the founding area very quickly, I mean, the one thing that the founders understood and that I think we've actually done a pretty good job of, of observing in this country is that we keep the police very separate from the military. Um, we understand that there are two institutions with very two very different jobs. Right? The, the military's job is to kill people and break things. And well, the military's job is to keep people from getting to us. Right. And the police job is to make sure that people inside our borders treat each other well. That, well, that if, if there's the wrong, bad guys are off the street. Well, and, and a, I mean, a, a, a soldier's job is to basically to annihilate a foreign enemy, right? right? And a cop's job is to keep the peace and protect our rights. Um, Norm, one's Norm, one's Norm, to hurt, one's to protect. Right. Norm, Norm Stamper, the uh, former police chief of Seattle, put it, put it in, uh, in another way, which I think is observant. He said a soldier's job is to follow orders, a police officer's job is to make decisions. Um, and so these are these are two very different roles and you can't, you know, when you conflate the two, you run into a lot of problems, as you, you know, as you might imagine. Um, and so we've done a good job of sort of understanding that the military should not be used for domestic policing. There have been a few times when there are a few exceptions. Reconstruction is a major, one major exception that I think was probably justified at the time. Um, but then if you look at uh, in the 80s, uh, the Reagan administration and leaders of both parties actually wanted to bring the military in to do drug policing. So they wanted Marines to be doing drug raids and arresting people and searching people. And I think to our credit, to the kind of the, the health of our democracy, the institution that was most opposed to that and, and that eventually beat it down was the military itself. Um, they understood that this is- Really? Was, yeah, that it was, there was a guy named uh, Thomas Olstead who was a pretty high ranking guy in the Pentagon who was called before Congress. And I think Congress sort of called him there like thinking he was gonna be very gung ho with this idea. Uh, and he, he kind of dressed them down. I mean, it, there, there's a couple beautiful quotes that he makes about how like history is replete with you know, collapsed societies that allowed the military to sort of take over the government. Um, 
so we've done a good job, though, for, for the most part of keeping the military out. So what I argue in the book is that where we've dropped the ball is that we've allowed police officers and really encouraged them um, to, uh, to to turn into soldiers, to adopt the uh, mindset of soldiers. I mean, you know, today. What is the mindset of a soldier? Help me out. What do, what uh, do you the mean? mindset of soldiers uh, is is that if you're not with me, you're the enemy. That that you know, the people. When a soldier goes out on a battlefield, uh, he's got his guys around him. Uh, who you, he, you don't mean that in a derogatory way. No, no. That, that, that's, I mean, that's what a soldier is supposed to do. Exactly. You know, you're you're in the battlefield. You're either on this team or you're on that team. Right. I will protect you on this team. I will kill you on that team. That's and that's an appropriate role right. for. I mean, that's an appropriate mindset for a soldier to have. I mean, that's how you win. And I take orders, and, right? Uh, and police officers, that's not a healthy attitude for them to have. I mean, they they should view the people that they interact with on a daily basis as citizens that they serve, not as potential threats to them. And I mean, we've gotten to the point today where I mean, police officers are told constantly that you know uh, that how how dangerous their jobs are, the fact that every interaction with a citizen could be their last. Uh, and if you tell somebody that over and over again, and then you, you know, you give them a military weapon, you dress them in military clothes. A lot of police departments are moving to these battle dress uniform style uniforms. Uh, you give them tanks and uh, you know armored personnel carriers and helicopters. You train them in military tactics, and then you send them out in the streets and tell you tell them they're fighting a war, whether it's the war on drugs or terror or crime. That's going to have an effect on their mentality, and it's going to have an effect on how they approach their jobs, how they interact with their communities. And you know the book is not um, you know it's not an anti-cop book. The book is, if anything, it's an anti-politician book. I mean, it, we can rail against cops for you know all we want, but the, I, I think it's the policies set, that have been put in place by politicians for a couple generations now uh, that have gotten us here. And I think until those policies change, it's going to be difficult to change sort of what policing has become today. Let me ask some of the obvious questions. Sure. So what's the problem here? Mm. Um, it's dangerous on the streets. Yeah, I hear the arguments that we want to be well armed because our our opponents uh, are often well armed. Mm -hmm. That we need to be ready for different contingencies. You know, we don't know when when a terrible shooting or mass shooting event will happen, or even a terrorist uh, event right. now. So therefore, we need to have things. We need our mobile command center. We we need to have uh, armored vehicles because. The other guys have a lot of firepower. We need to be protected because if we need to go into a riot, we can't be we can't be taken out. These these seem pretty reasonable to me. What's wrong well, with that argument? Sure, and those are reasonable arguments for those particular situations that you know you need a, a if you have a riot going on, you need an overwhelming response. If you have an, an active shooter situation, you need a quick and overwhelming response. Um, and I'm not, you know, I'm not opposed to SWAT teams. I think there's a place uh, and a, a use for them. The problem SWAT is SWAT stands for. I always forget. Uh, well, strategic special weapon, weapon special, special weapons, weapons and tactics. Okay. Yeah. It was originally Daryl Gates who invented it. Initially wanted it to stand for special weapons assault team, uh, and somebody at LAPD told him it's probably not a good idea to have assault in the actual name. Um, so. But the problem is that the, the amount of force that the government is willing to use uh, is no longer commensurate to the threat. So if we reserve SWAT teams for these those um, emergency type situations where you're using violence to defuse an already violent scenario, so again, your active shooters, your bank robberies, escaped fugitive, a terrorist attack, um, that I think is a per perfectly appropriate use for that kind of force. The problem is that's not how it's used today. It's overwhelmingly, about 80% of SWAT raids today are used to serve search warrants on people suspected of drug crimes. Um, and we're now seeing, as I mentioned at the top of the show, you know, moving into mission creep, even beyond the drug war now, to where they're being used to enforce regulatory law. I mean, there was... Um, give me, yeah, give me, give me an example. Here. Um, so uh, uh, bars where there's underage drinking going on. A couple years ago in Orlando, there were a bunch of uh, barber shops where police suspected there was drug activity, but they couldn't get enough evidence to get a search warrant, which meant they had no evidence at all. Um, so what they did is they called somebody up from the State Occupational Licensing Board who sent an inspector along, and now these were officially uh, licensure inspections to make sure the barbers were properly licensed to cut hair. But they sent the SWAT team, uh, and then you know they would put guns at everybody's head and search them, and um, and they ended up arresting 37 people. Uh, 34 of them were arrested for barbering without a license. Uh, they arrested, you know, they found. And that's why you and I have no hair. That's right. They, they, um, uh, and you know, three, you know, they found three people with drugs on them. But you know, th this is this is where we're going. I mean, there was a, a story I wrote uh, about three weeks ago in Texas where 
there was a SWAT team sent, which is basically uh, to, to enforce zoning laws. This woman had like not cut her grass in a long time. She had you know some furniture out on her lawn. The city was complaining. She was resisting doing anything about it. So they sent the SWAT team in to basically terrorize this woman. You know they they claimed it was a uh, that they had heard had reports that there were maybe some marijuana plants on the property, but you know they end up like cutting yeah, so her grass. It's, it's a show of force. It's it is to say hey you know we've. You should listen. We we've got the tools. We know how to use them. And this is and this is where I think we, we've entered sort of what I would say is sort of terrifying new territory. I mean, when the government is using, I mean, we trust the government. We give the government the power to use force to protect us from threats, right? If we get to the point where the government is using violence to make a statement, or to make a political point, to make an example of somebody, I mean, that's what we're seeing with the medical marijuana raids, right? I mean, the, the hippie mom, the pop couple who run the dispensary aren't a threat to pull an AR-15 out from under the counter and murder a bunch of federal agents, right? The, the reason why the federal government sends SWAT teams in to raid those dispensaries is because they're openly flouting federal law and the federal government wants to make an example of them. All right, we've got less than a minute. Tell me what you want to see. If, mm -hmm. if that's the problem, give me the solution. Uh, wow. Um, I mean, I, I think a couple of things. First, we need to return to the, the, this idea or, or embrace this idea of community policing, where cops are walking beats, where they know, you know, the names, the principals of the schools they're on actually, their beats. They're actually talking to people rather than sitting in their car, and they only come out of their car when they see something go right. bad. There was a time when you'd walk and you'd meet these people and they'd get to know you. And, and you want the cops to have a stake in the communities that they serve so that when it is time to use force, the community sees it as one of their own, sort of protecting them and not this force that's been opposed on them from the outside. All right, this is the book. It's worth worth doing. Um, the Warrior Cop. What what a great what, what a great book. Thank you for doing it. And if I get if I get pulled over on my way back from the studio, it's all your it's fault. It's my fault. It's all I, your fault. Mention my name. And I'll mention your name. That, and that and a hundred bucks usually takes care of it. Hey, listen for me on K H O W. That's six thirty A M radio. Tell a friend about the Independence Institute, and we will see you next week right here. Take care.